greet you all in Jesus' name. Um, let's uh, stand and pray, those that can. <clears throat> oh God, Father in heaven, we look to you at this time for, for being sufficient for our help. Um, and we do thank you for that. And we praise you for the many wonderful things and blessings that you have bestowed upon us. You have given us all things that is necessary for salvation. And all things that we need to uh, obtain God in us and righteousness. We thank you for that. We see, the, we see this as a, as a great responsibility and we need your help. Um, that we can have a pure conscience and a clean heart as we come before you. We thank you so much for all that has been shared so far and um, for Brother Max's message here and many things that came out through the scriptures. Just help us, God, that we can... We can... Uh, apply these things to life. Bless each one here and and the things that I am to speak. Just pray that this could be for the edification of the saints and for the building up of the body. In your precious name, amen. Um, yeah, the just want to first of all say the things that I speak today, I wished that, uh, that it would enhance what Brother Max had to say or, uh, or support it or, or lift it up. I'm so much in agreeance, agreeance to all those things. Um, I appreciate the explaining the... I've heard you use the word paradigm. I just I hadn't really entered my vocabulary and I appreciate... Like, I understand now what you're talking about, how, how it is that uh, a paradigm shift you know, how devastating it can be or how good it can be. And I just had to think of these, of this in, in the way of, uh, oh, just like what Jesus said, that the light that be in thee, if it be darkness, oh, how great that darkness would be. Like if, if you have a wrong view of the light or a wrong explanation of it, how devastating, how bad. If, uh, if we begin teaching wrong teaching from a wrong viewpoint. And so, just real thankful for the meeting so far. Um, yeah, I could also think of many th things or a few things that my dad, um, I wish I could think of more. Uh, I'm sure there was more that, that he would teach that would be good for me today. I had the opportunity to help him build a little, uh, oh, a little milk barn, and uh, I had to think of this as you were telling your story of your dad and the memories that that he uh, left left for you. I know your dad's not here either, same as mine isn't, and uh, I'm on the left with memories too. So we were cutting out these rafters, and this was supposed to be very precise. This, this was a low roof. My dad didn't want it to look wavy. And he said that we, have, we always have to stick with this original rafter as we go to lay out the rest of the rafters. And as we, as we uh, mark them and cut them, we have to precisely go off the original one. That really has stuck in my mind. Just uh, a good life lesson that, that my memory has gone back to many, many times. It's been very profitable. So I hope I can be that way to young people in my, my family. Just need help in that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, what I, uh, I kind of came to or want to speak about today has uh, to do with the two covenants that we can see throughout history that have been, been uh, a part of history, I guess you would say. Um, there was an old covenant, there was a new covenant, or there is a new covenant, of which we are uh, 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 blessed to be, to be able to live in that one. And uh, so I just want to 
point out some some things about those two that that I think are very important and even essential for us to understand so that we can so that we can come from the right foundation as we look at as we look at things that pertain to life and godliness salvation and so on because here again if we have a, a wrong beginning point um, we can easily come up with wrong applications in how we apply the New Testament covenant or how we look at um, the nature of it. So, so bear with me as I go through these things. I don't know how well I have them laid out, but I, I wanted to begin with at least pointing out some differences that I believe that is in the old and the new and then also some similarities. I believe the the old and the new have have their have their odds a little bit like the kingdom of this world does in the kingdom of God. And that was kind of helpful for me to come to come to an understanding of these two. Um, they are very different in 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 their realm. The the kingdom of uh, of Israel had had its borders. It had its uh, what was called back then the like the holy lands even still there's Jerusalem is considered the holy lands by whoever I believe but but there was borders and there was there was just this certain little realm that that was this was supposed to apply to um, very different than the kingdom of God I uh, I think of that as being something that that uh, permeates every area of the earth and it even brought me to thinking of the parables in a little different light because of that. The, um, the parables of the, the mustard seed, the parables of the yeast that the women put in the, in the dough, the parable of, of the treasure that was hidden in a field that a man sells everything when he finds this, this hidden thing and he, he counts it as a great price. Um, like the mustard seed, it, it starts out small. It starts out small like Jesus' New Covenant, it started out small. And from there it permeated. It, it, was, it was known more throughout the, the area of Asia Minor, and then it just went and went and went from there. Um, the kingdom of... Uh, I, I'm, I'm calling it kingdom now, but the covenant, the old covenant, at least the law part of it, there was a lot of people. It started out pretty big. And, it, and in that way it's kind of different. And it, it seems like of these 600,000 men under this covenant with promise left Egypt how many entered the promised land? Two. Two. Of those, of those people. It, it went from in that way it went from big to little whereas I see the kingdom of, of God here that Jesus represents um, starting small and growing out bigger. So, so there's some there's some interesting points of differences that I came to. Um, it always has, the old always has had a changing priesthood. The, the new has an unchangeable priest with, with an everlasting, uh, an everlasting priesthood. Um, The old, the old covenant had this thing about itself that, that seemed so unperfect, that it seemed so fault with fault. And, and I, I don't really feel guilty of calling it that way because Paul called it something with fault. If, or whoever wrote Hebrews said things like, if the old had been without fault, why would there have been a need for a new? And so on. So it had this fault. I especially see it in... Uh, um, that there was allowances given for a sinful, in God's eyes, a sinful action because of the hardness of heart. How faulty is that? Like, divorce was, was given way for this holy people of Israel, something that from the beginning was not so. And here, because of the hardness of heart, there was allowances given. And um, in the in the new, 
it was it was started out with with a uh, a message of repentance, and it 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 has a very different nature in that way. It has a very different message in that way. The old seems to have a nature of allowance and compromise, basically. Um, I had to think of you. You went to Mark 12 there, and you you mentioned about this. Uh, Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That was, that was Jesus' reply, I believe, to this question, what is the greatest command? And he, he just laid it out like that. Um, if I remember right, this, this man went on to say that, that he agrees with that. And he kind of quoted it back and said that this is more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And, and after that, that man was fit to hear the words, like, you are just about by the kingdom. That's what Jesus ended up saying. You, you, you are close to the kingdom of God. And, and I think that's where, we, that's where we have to come to, where we have this, um, this heart of loving the Lord our God with, with every ounce of our being and having an understanding that that is more than burned offerings and sacrifices. Um... Not to say that those didn't have their purpose; those were, those were shadows and um, and uh, figures of things to come. But uh, so much for that. I want to I want to get into the scriptures about this. This will mostly be from the New Testament. Um, Jesus said that uh, till heaven and earth pass away, not one. See, have I, I might have it quoted here. I have, short, I have a short version of it. Till heaven and earth pass away, not one child or tittle shall in no wise pass away till all be fulfilled. So we can see this thing, I think I said this before, uh, like a timer building itself up to this time when it was supposed to happen. There is nothing going to happen, and there is nothing going to uh, keep it from happening. When the time was for it to come, it came. I think there's in places there's um, is comparable, or in my mind is comparable to um, just just maybe the way the way it goes with um, with a birth or something. It's just there is a certain time we think it's close. We we, we come to thinking, oh, it's just a day off or two days off. But only God knows exactly how long. Maybe it's going to be four or five days off. In this way, there was there was everything going to happen just like the prophets had spoken about, and then it happened. And and so in that way, it was fulfilled. Um, the re the reason for it was to was to preserve preserve the seed in some ways, and uh, some other reasons for it. I think was to show sinful nature in man so that we can learn from that somewhere in Hebrews maybe we'll read on it later how can we escape so great a salvation if we um, like if we don't take these things for warnings that were in the past how can we escape so great a salvation let's start reading here and uh, I have a few verses in Galatians of course a lot of this that I'm going to find is going to be in Hebrews Galatians chapter 2 um, starting verse 18 through 21. For if I build again the things which I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. For though the, the law, for through the law, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto, unto God. I am crucified unto Christ, nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Galatians 3, 19 through 29. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, 
till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. I think this is where I got the idea that the two reasons for the law was, one was because of transgressions. Um, and the other ones, the other one was for the keeping of the, of the seed. Um, however, that could be ex could be explained. There was a promise wrapped up in all of that as well. Verse 20, Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scriptures hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Twenty-three. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterward be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Could it have been possible that, that God would have brought in the new kingdom, the new covenant, without first having his people go through the old? Here it seems like maybe it wouldn't have been possible. Um, it says that the law was given as a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. That was the value of it. That's what it was worth. It was the thing that that was going to show us the need for Christ, the reason for Christ, and how, how that... Uh, this, this thing would only, only uh, be a channel, not an actual source. Verse 25, But after that faith has come, we, no longer, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. I think some other version, versions might say guardians, and that's, that's a good rendering of it, I think. We're not under this guardian anymore. A guardian is never intended to be like a true parent, a true father. A guardian is only someone. Um, if you start a guardianship, I believe, when you start it, you know that it has an end. You know that you're, you're, not, you're only the, the caregiver for, for a moment, for a certain time. And in that way, if we can look at the Old Covenant in that way, I think it's helpful to understand why it had to be that way. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seeds and heirs according to the promise. If we are Christ, we are Abraham's seed. Go on and read in chapter 4. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. But is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Isn't it much better to be considered a son than a servant? Um, a son, a son can inherit all things. A servant has its limits, which is another thing that would differ from old, old covenant to new covenant. And... Um, I believe it would be safe to say we, come, we become sons uh, of Christ. 
would become the seat of Abraham through, through faith. I think all that's described right in this. That's how we become sons. I found it interesting how that Paul was making this, um, all these points. If we, if we look at the beginning of the chapter, we can see that there was a beginning thought that was drifting away from what had happened at Pentecost the, and what, had, what was being established as a church. There was a drifting away. Paul called them foolish who has bewitched you. And guess what was that bewitching? Like this, this thing that was, that was having them drift away was, uh, was things like going back to the, to the Old Testament, going back to this um, dead horse and, and thinking that it's alive or trying to, trying to put some, some emphasis on, on things that, that were only a shadow of things to come. And, and Paul just had to make it real clear. He, he even ended up saying that if any man come into your midst, or if even I come into your midst and you preach any other thing than Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. And that would include pre the preaching of, uh, um, of the Old Covenant in a way that, that it, would, it would still give allowances for uh, sins such as divorce, or that it would be okay to to have a commandment of circumcision, or it would be okay to go with the old um, priesthood. These are all things that, that if, it, if, if things start heading this way, I think we can go to, with some clear direction to the Galatians here and see, see what kind of a problem Paul had with that. Um, seems like it's even in this, in, this, in this to the Galatians that Paul had to rebuke Peter that had... Uh, some respect of persons, he, he was, hmm, I don't know, I guess still Peter in some ways where he had, had some of that uh, desire for uh, acceptance or desire for, well, he was just partial in his ways, how he, he uh, communed or ate or whatever they were doing, fellowshipping um, with the Gentiles. And then when he heard that James and the, and the Jews, Jewish believers are coming, he, he just kind of sidestepped. And Peter was a very influential man. This was going to, this, this, had Paul not put an end to this, this would have taken a very devastating um, way, I believe. Um, but I think through humility, things worked out good. Let's see if I can find that. Galatians 2, chap chapter, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But then when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dis dissembled likewise with him, Inasmuch that Barnabas, yeah, see how Barnabas was, Barnabas was carried away with this dissimulation as well. But when I saw that they were not, that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by, by the faith of Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. I think that verse 18, I read that one already. It's kind of interesting to find that that is in context of of what I'm talking about. Let's read 17 then, then 18. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ. We ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the thing, things which I destroyed. I make myself a transgressor. Sounds like he 
he would have been speaking for Peter, like Peter had destroyed, Peter had this great revelation of how he was supposed to preach to the Gentiles. This was firmly in his mind that he is a messenger for the Gentiles. God had showed this to him through a vision. Um, those things can be found in Acts. Peter at first was resistant to it, like, no, I can't eat this unclean stuff. And I, these are, these are animals with, with uh, that are, according to the old covenant, they're unclean. I can't eat them. And God just put it right back to him, like, no, no, things are different now. Things are different now. Now all things are clean. Um, and and that vision then suddenly like a light came on for Peter and he suddenly realized yes this this thing that 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 was for the Jews was only for a time and that there would be a time coming that there would be a universal kingdom that would uh, be like a mustard seed and it would be to the point that the birds of the air would it would be so big and strong eventually that the birds of the air would, you know, rest in it. And um, basically that it would be for all people and it would permeate all the parts of the earth. And, and he had accepted that. He had gladly accepted that. He, throughout Acts, you can see that he, he gladly preached it. And then, and then right here, he just, mm, he kind of slipped back. Just, just for a moment, I think he repented and, and things went well for him after that, but but that would be that be just another pointer how that it seems it seems to me like the greatest temptation for for the for someone that has begun this journey that has entered into this narrow way of life is is for somehow wanting to to be recognized or to be what I call or maybe I've heard brothers brothers say legit like they just want to be they want to present themselves as legit to whoever sees them with with whatever it might be you can just you can just think it up like we want a big crowd so that we can so that we can proclaim ourselves as a church and and then we can present ourselves as something to the world um, I don't know is that is that what Paul what Peter was was kind of leaning towards or was it just just this very thing of uh, of just wanting praise of men. He wanted his fellow Jews to be very acceptant of him. Already they had made it they had already made the the Jerusalem council that the Gentile believers are not going to be asked more than just these three or four points. Um and to uh yeah again just just seeing the the nature of, of Peter there just brings me to the thinking how, and haven't we seen in our day how, how easy it is for people to um, walk on this narrow path and you think of them as being strong men and then, and then suddenly you, they, they just go towards this certain thing of uh, um, wanting to set up like a priestly um, priesthood where there's something very tangible where they can be sure with, without a shadow of a doubt that this would be pleasing to God. And um, I want everyone to understand me right, that, that I, believe, I believe there's an order that God set out. There's an order for mankind in the church, in the family. If we want something to function, we, we need order. I'm not diminishing that, but, but this thing that I was previously talking about is just very lacking in faith. It's just very lacking in faith, um, in, in a simple understanding of truth. All right, let's turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 says that... Um, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, 
whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. We can see a transition there, can't we? In times past he spoke he spoke unto the fathers by the prophets. Like these things were um, spoken of. And see, people in that day, I'm not wanting to portray this as something that they, they didn't have salvation. They were altogether lost. There was no hope for them. There was hope for them. Just as much as there's hope for us today. Um, their hope was in the, in the promised one to come, the Messiah, uh, the, the one that would be the, law, the real lawgiver. And I think they would, they would look at their present situation as, as an ending thing. I think that was enough. For them, for them to have salvation. Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 1 through 6. Wherefore holy, beloved, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house has more glory than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that buildeth all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of the things which were to be spoken after. I think Moses had this thing. Um, maybe I'll read this verse in New Living Translation see I think it's really clear there Moses was certainly fear, faithful in God's house, house as a servant his work was an illustration of the truth God would reveal later and, and I think Moses understood this that he, he is a servant for, for the moment he had his ups and downs, sure, but but he's he's a great example of of a lawgiver, and that's another thing that's different. We have a different lawgiver in the in the new covenant. That's the old. If we think of Moses as being the the mediator or or the one that that actually handed the law to the people, it's different in that way. Or if we think of the of the new, how that how that Jesus now is the lawgiver. And uh, that's that's not to say that that Moses wasn't doing his job. That's just saying that that, that was that was okay for that time, and that was uh, that was the right thing for Moses to do at that time. Okay, then verse six says, "But Christ, as His Son, over His own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence of the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end." But Christ, as the Son, is in charge of God's entire house, and we are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. Moses is considered a servant. Um, maybe in a way like he's outside the household. Not outside as in, as in not, not a good servant or not, not worthy of... Uh, of any good rewards, but is servant in that that there's a greater one coming, which is actually going to be the Son, the very Son of God, coming, um, coming as a lawgiver. Isn't there reason to give that lawgiver more attention, more credence? Isn't there, isn't there more confidence that we can have in that lawgiver than than the one of old that we knew would, that that we knew would. Uh, give allowances for, for, for certain things and compromises. And and I sure do. I, I just really like that verse 6, how that... I'll read it again. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end. Now let's go to... Uh, I thought I had a few more points in there, but um, 
probably I have covered it. Chapter 4, verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. It says in New Living, God's promise of entering his rest still stands, so we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. Verse 2, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith, in them that heard it. For we have believed, for we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, I have sworn by in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the Sabbath day on this wise, and God did rest the Sabbath day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Maybe I'll stop there. Um, where does that put us? Like these, these are so great reminders for me just to check my heart and my life, knowing how there's more to it than, than first entering into the kingdom. Um... There is a uh, possibility of uh, coming short of it. Like there's a possibility of, of just falling short. Just um, not, not continuing. And uh, these, these things in the, in the text here, I think it would be, the difference would be um, faith that endureth or, or those that didn't didn't continue in faith, and then it was counted as unbelief. It was because of their unbelief that they did not enter in. Verse 16 says, chapter 4, verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of God, that we may obtain mercy and find grace, to help in time of need. Don't we all f feel that sometimes? Just this, this, we're in a time of need, are we not? Um, it seems like over and over there are things that, that I'm faced with, whether I'm raising a family or walking with brothers. It's, it's all such a blessed thing. Or working with brothers. It is. I wouldn't want any different life, okay? Um, but, but it sure it sure has its challenges and and I want to be sure to say that I wouldn't want it I wouldn't want it different at all I just if 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 the things that I want would want different though would be to to continue further into uh, into the knowledge of God into a better understanding of, of his truth um, but I think the answer is wrapped up in here if we, if we are at those places of um, having to find grace or help in the time of need, it says, "Let us come boldly into the throne of God, throne of grace." Sorry, let us come boldly into the throne of grace. This thing that teaches us that we are to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, and that we are to live soberly and righteously in this world. Let's come to that thing and let's face it for what it is, uh, boldly, with confidence. With, with hope that this is the true right thing. And I'm not talking about a self-righteous confidence. There is this element of that, um, or a warning that goes along with that. He that thinketh he stands, take heed lest he fall. All that has to be worked out as we go through life. Um, Hebrews 7, we're just going to go through Hebrews um, and I'll um, read some verses as we go. Hebrews 7, verse 11, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, 
for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? I found that interesting. Okay, quite a few things. First of all, why would there be a need for a second one if the first one was faultless? Well, the first one was faultless. Let's just accept it. And so there was a need for the second one. And, and if we understand some big verses like, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Through this channel, I, I just, it, just makes so, it just makes sense. The old, the old priesthood, the old system was, it was ready to decay. It was ready to, ready to, uh, to die out. And, and there was a need for a new, new priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. It's kind of interesting how that that's different too. Like the, the old covenant priesthood was after the order of Aaron. That was very, very strictly the order of things. As they came down through through the ages, that was always the order of things, according to Aaron and, and his descendants and so on. Um, Whoever it was going to be, the, the Levites held held a portion of that, but but then there's this really interesting, profound um, order of Melchizedek that Jesus was going to come through. I have not come to understand that all completely. I just found it find it very profound, very interesting. Um, I think in that way, these these Pharisees. Pharisees and the religious people of that day just thought for sure they, they would have a legitimate point to denounce Jesus as a as a demon, basically. Because he came through these uh, ways that they just thought were not were not right, were not uh, the right way. But but again it was going back to Max's point, like it was coming from the wrong the wrong foundation, the wrong framework. All right, verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. We're very familiar with that. Jesus said many things like, you have heard it being said to them of old time this way, but I say, like just for instance, like love your, um, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Like a very... Jesus had all this right and all this, all this, uh, an open door to, to make these new, new commands because it was a new priesthood. It was a new lawgiver. Verse 13, For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our God sprang out of Judah, our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident that for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there rises another priest. who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the spirit of an endless life. Um, I think my point there would, would just be how, how Mel Melchizedek, no beginning, no ending, recorded of him. Um, very similar with, with the new covenant, um, like an endless life to it. We could think of Mel Melchizedek and the new covenant in a very similar way. An, an endless everlasting covenant or an endless everlasting life. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitable thereof, unprofitableness thereof. I just think I just think of it more and more as a big deal. If people, if people want to go to the old covenant to justify war, to justify different things that they want for their flesh, um, to support their their thing. I I mean, here it's being called um, 
the commandments of weakness and un unprofitableness. Uh, what, what I think makes it so devastating is that by putting credence to that one, you are then by default um, disannulling the real one, the actual one, the one that Christ brought, which would be the same as saying denying Christ. Verse 19, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath. But this one with an oath, by him that said unto him, The Lord swore, and will not repent, thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Yeah, there was death, so they had to replace him. Jesus, Jesus, um, Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek in, in such a way as he, he, he continues to live. 24. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the utmost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest came us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as these high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. For this he did once when he offered up himself. What a great message. Um, let's go to Hebrews 8. Maybe I, maybe I should read that last verse because 8 is right next up. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmities, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son who is consecrated forevermore. Seems like this point just gets reestablished as he, as he goes through this I think uh, I think repetitious probably is what what we need a lot. It's probably what the what the Jewish believers needed back then. A very repetitious, like over and over. This old system is broke. The new one is sufficient. The old system is broke. The new one is sufficient. And over and over, the old one had priests that died. The new one doesn't. And just on, on, on. Um, anyhow, chapter eight. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Like here is, here, is, here is the main point. We have such an high priest who is set at the right hand of the throne of, ma of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on, on earth... He should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not saying these priests weren't doing their job for the time being. They, they were set out to, to do these things, and that was true, that was right, that was good. I am not condemning them at all. Um, I would even trust that probably a lot of them knew that they, they were doing a thing that was an example of the shadow of heavenly things. And in that way, I believe, they were acceptable in God's eyes. Because there in 5 it says, Who served unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou makest all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been thought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Maybe if we watch for those fine details of, of why, why a second covenant or why a new one, this would be another reason, because they continued not in my covenant. Um, verse, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know him, from the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxes old is ready to vanish away. Chapter 10. I think in this chapter it kind of uh, ends speaking about new and old covenants and stuff. Uh, but I'll read. I'll read 19 uh, through 27. 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of the blood of Christ by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a new high priest, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. We can trust this new lawgiver as being like pure water, there won't be any stains, no calcium deposits, no, no spots, no, no blemishes. What I mean by that, though, is that, that He is that. I'm not saying that, that we won't find ourselves with spots and blemishes sometimes, and then we have to work, work on those things, but, but that we, we can be confident that, if, that we, if we wash ourselves with the word of this high priest, that, that there is a clean cleansing. And we can have an evil, con we can be sprinkled from an evil conscience. Our evil consciences can be put away. Um, and in that way we can boldly enter the holiest of, of the blood of, of Jesus. I think there might be some, some lesson or message concerning his flesh. Like the veil, the comparison between the veil and his flesh. The veil being rent and Jesus' body being rent. Um, I don't have the exp explanation for it at the moment. Um, 30, 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to prov provoke unto love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as we see the day approaching. Maybe I'll stop there a little bit. I think I had a thought. Um, being, being sprinkled from an evil conscience and being washed with the pure water. Just, just how, how consciences, they'll, they'll still be there. We, we all each are going to have an individual conscience thinking for ourselves individually okay but but never should should that kind of a thinking or that kind of a conf conscience bring on a division it should not that should I've always thought I think I've a long ago already come to the conclusion that that divisions need to come because of offenses but but that they should not come just because of a certain conscience that that we have and, and I think that's the reason why we have to get sprinkled from evil consciences. So, so that it doesn't happen like it says in 25, like forsaking the assembly of ourselves. Just can't, just can't bear to be in the presence of a certain brother. And I just, just hold this thing that I'm so sure I'm right on and, and he's so wrong on. And, and we haven't really, we haven't maybe really cleansed or sprinkled our evil conscience. And therefore, we, we 
we start not assembling together anymore, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more, as ye see the day approaching. 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. That's, that's a pretty, pretty strong statement. Um, but it does say what remains. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. He that despised Moses died, law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall be, shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has come the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Just quite sobering just to think of all those things. I don't know how much more I have to share. I just really desire that we would uh, be able to uh, continue in this faith this faith that was once for all delivered unto the saints that that the world knew nothing of and that uh, it's like this precious precious treasure that that if we seek we will find it if we knock the door will be opened unto us and once we find it we should hold on to it as as something that we would be willing to sell everything around us and hang on to this precious price in a way that um, that we don't hang on to anything else like that. Um, I have a note here. Maybe I'll read Second uh, Peter 2 yet, kind of in closing, or maybe I have some thoughts. Just how... Um, I think all we have to do to lose this thing I'm talking about is is um, is like nothing. Like all we have to do to lose this is, is to do nothing. But really, there is no such thing. That's just a. There's nothing like doing nothing. We are always doing something. We're going backwards, or we're going, or we're going backwards, or we're going forwards. And and I think that was kind of the thought, as I wanted to close out on Second uh, Peter. Chapter one, verse three, according as his divine. Power has given unto us all things that pertain unto God, life and God in us, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Wherefore are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine natures, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Okay, so, so this statement is saying that all things pertaining to life and godliness have been given to us. Like all the all the different parts, all the all the different things that would uh, sustain us through life as we go through these battles. It has been given to us. Verse five. And besides this, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then it ends with a but, a but verse. It starts with but. But he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if Ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Leave it at that. Let's pray. <clears throat> oh God, we we pray to you with thankful hearts again for for a good day you gave us. Just for that you're you're looking for praises and you're looking for, for lips that would worship you and for for eyes that would see things your way and for a, a heart that would Seek after you under the way you are and, and understand you and uh, feet that would uh, walk after you and uh, we we thank you so much for these great and precious promises that, that you uh, you have provided us with all things that 
that we need for, for life and God in us. And bless each one here and just uh, pray that your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In your precious name, amen. Well, it's open for comments or correction. Thank you, Brother Atley, for a good edifying message. One one thought I had, um, you talked about that quote in Galatians chapter 1, where Paul talks about that if he or any other, or even an angel comes in and preaches any other gospel than the one that they've been given, let him be accursed. And he says it twice. And I just thought, if if an authority like Paul could say that, <clears throat> about himself concerning turning turning back to old covenant ways or law how much more should we be diligent today to just not check our brains at the door and accept anything that's taught by somebody who claims authority um, was one thought I had and then you uh you were talking in Hebrews. Um, yeah, I think it's in Hebrews chapter 10. You were talking about and you were talking about the veil. And I, I could be wrong in this, but it seemed like I've, I picked up somewhere along the way that that, and I think it underscores your, your whole message pretty well, the idea of the veil. When Jesus was crucified, that veil surrounding the holiest of holies was torn and it seems like they're building the case that we've got a perfect priest in the book of Hebrews, whereas in the old times past, the only one who had access to God, where God was supposed to be dwelling in the temple, which was within the holiest of holies, was that priest, uh, once a year to offer sacrifice for you. And when that veil was torn from top to bottom, and from what I understand it was a big, thick, heavy veil, that's why the writer of Hebrews says things like um, that we should enter in with boldness. Um, like that old imperfect system of having to have your, your sins cleansed once a year by sacrifice of some animal or thing is now handled by the most excellent priest being Jesus and that we've got access to him. Uh, but I guess I just, I appreciated the message about the old covenant being the things imperfect and the, the new covenant being all things realized in perfection and in Jesus. Thank you again, Brother Atley. And so many points you made that uh, we could uh, treasure in our heart. I like to point you said we go through various trials and tribulations and it should humble us to think that uh, we need God's help and guidance and then we can come boldly to the throne. I know, I guess, when, well, I don't know, but I assume when David killed Uriah, he probably wrote that psalm, uh, Psalm 51. And someone has said once, you're, you're the closest to God when you're at your worst point of, you know, your sinful life or something when he, uh, not just uh, adultery with Bathsheba, but uh, having Uriah killed uh, with some of the uh, covenants you said out there. Is, 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 uh, oh, and we need that humility too. I, I assume that a lot of us fasted for Steve and uh, Tyler, and as Brother Walter said, for our own self-righteousness and humility that we're, uh, we're not it, and to understand that uh, the secret things belong to God, the things revealed belong to us. His ways and thoughts are so much higher than ours. Last night there was a storm, and I had to pull off the road. I usually don't work Saturday nights, but I did a split shift, and I remember the blinding rain, and I didn't see a rainbow. It's one of the old covenants, right? The first covenant was, never again will I destroy the earth, or the people on the earth, between you and Rainbow. Sometimes you see double rainbows. I've heard someone upside down rainbow, maybe a triple rainbow. 
that would be an amen and an amen, perhaps. I don't, I don't know, but the Ark of the Covenant, covenant of salt. Now the covenant that he writes in our hearts, Jeremiah 31, 31. Uh, later on, I might talk a little more about my conversation with Brother Calvin last night, but one other thought about the Apostle Peter. Growing up a Catholic, they love the external and the physical. St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, they have the bones of St. Peter, supposedly the bones of St. Peter there, and they built upon that, upon this rock over my church. And so it's a double symbolism, so to speak, Peter building on the church, uh, Peter being the foundation of the church to Rome, the church of Christ, and like this upon Peter, he's the rock, and his uh, bones are supposedly under there. But as I shared with Calvin, I'm saying, what a, what a shaky foundation. You know, uh, Paul said, some of Peter, Apollos, the, uh, uh, who else? Apollos and me. Paul, Peter, who else? Oh, Peter, Paul, Apollos, and, well, and Christ, of course. But anyway, uh, Peter, a great example, but depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Jesus said, to, get away from me, Satan. You're hindering me. Imagine calling <laughs> the rock. Call, Jesus called him Satan. Satan, get behind me. You're hindering me. And... Uh, so many things. Paul rebuked him. Peter, of course, would mention his humility is out. You read Second Peter 2, forgetting that we've been purged from our sins. But um, the rock, just that, that people build their faith upon, and uh, the traditions. Of course, Mary is greater than Peter to the Catholics, and perhaps the, the Orthodox too. But Jesus said to her, you know, when she came and said, uh, or well, the apostle said, your mother and brother, and he shoved his hand, who are my brothers and sisters and mother? Those who do the word. And not to beat up on Peter, but the um, apostolic succession of Sherwood Calvin is real shaky. Uh, I mean, there's a possibility we could be wrong, but uh, as you shared at Lee and Twain before, you can't revive a dead horse and uh, their fruits. And Calvin recognizes that. He says, we're not going, if he does go that way, he's not going to mainstream orthodox, but he would go to a 1%, but a deal, one half of 1% of the orthodox who are following a godly way. But let's have that humility. The Lord be magnified. Those traditions that, that Calvin was talking about, and he talked about icons, he's not into it, but baby baptism, if he gets married, he said it, he might have us for his children, but he's not convinced. But these so called holy traditions, and that's on the same level as the Bible, the scriptures, would uh, overcompensate. And that's why they have uh, icons and uh, praying to saints. Or, yeah. uh, so much the baggage. And Jesus did say, In vain they worship me, teaches traditions of men. And when you combine that with the Catholics, or the Orthodox, they are all vain, just about all vain. They contradict scripture. And, uh, of course, they would say that, like the chicken and the egg, that the uh, uh, church gave us the gospel, and it was just the opposite, and this is an ongoing debate for centuries, by the preaching of the apostles came into the church. The, that's where the church was born on, on Pentecost. It was the preaching, the seed is the word of God, and it was in the preaching of the apostles that the church was born. And uh, that's a stumbling block for all apostolic successions groups. They want to assert right from the get-go that the Catholics or the Greeks or any uh, apostolic church gave us the gospel. And that's the strongest contradiction. It isn't. It's the word is the seed. And uh, the church wasn't founded to Pentecost, so how could the church be in existence before then? And that's how I look at it in my feeble brain. I just wanted to add one thought here. Uh, appreciate the the contrast, the similarities and contrasts that were brought out in the two covenants. Um, I thought I had it like without like without going into great depth why, but I think that the trying to mingle the two is what Jesus would have been talking about when he said, "You can't put." new wine in an old wineskin for it'll burst it uh, 
there's just there's just so many elements of the new covenant that um, they just won't work in an old covenant idea um, and so we must not only think about the new wine like the new the new the new teachings the new laws that Jesus brought but we must also put them in his new covenant or else they they'll just spill out and be lost <laughs>